Good morning. Welcome to this virtual roadmap session. My name is Jeff Allen. I'm executive director of Forth, and I'd like to welcome you to this virtual roadmap panel, Cities Leading the Transportation Electrification Charge. Uh, this is a good time to note that we will be sending out recordings and slides from these webinars uh, at the end of the week after the series concludes. So if you miss something, uh, no need to worry, you will get the complete recording later. Before we begin the session today, I do wanna take a moment just to recognize that this is a very remarkable time. Not only are we in the midst of the global COVID-19 pandemic that's disrupted our lives, but here in the United States, we're also confronting a pandemic of racism that has disrupted and ended the lives of people of color for generations. In recent weeks, we've been reminded of this by the murders of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and Breonna Taylor. And I think we all need to be reflecting, I know we at Forth are reflecting, on the need to double down on our efforts to center equity in our work and in our lives. As we said in our statement of solidarity, we can't succeed um, in our mission unless we are successful in tackling equity and we need to use our platform uh, to confront, disrupt, and address these historic inequities from our transportation and uh, policies and investments, whether that's redlining or urban renewal or gentrification, we need to confront and disrupt those systems. I think, I hope that this session today is a small contribution in that direction. For those of you who may not be familiar with us, Fourth is a nonprofit trade association and advocate for smart transportation. We have over 180 members. And in addition to hosting the Roadmap Conference every year, we create and manage demonstration projects. We advise local, state, uh, and national policymakers. And we run one of the largest direct consumer engagement programs in the country, including a downtown showroom and dozens of ride and drive events every year. Normally, we'd be hosting all of you in Portland for Roadmap right now in person. And we were very excited this year to be hosting these panels in conjunction with the International Electric Vehicle Symposium and welcoming a couple thousand new friends from around the world to Portland as well. Because of the cancellation due to COVID-19, of course, we're having to do these virtually. But I'm happy to announce that we have already set the date for Roadmap next year. It's up on your screen right now. And we hope you'll join us next year, June 29th and 30th here in Portland in person to continue this conversation. In fact, registration is already open online and we have a large early bird discount running through the end of the year. So I hope you'll make your plans now, put it on your calendar, even jump on and grab that um, ridiculously great deal um, on registration. I should note that sponsorship opportunities are also discounted through the end of the year. So if you know Roadmap, you love Roadmap, you want to be in front of your colleagues and your industry network next year, no better time to show that support and lock in your place than the next few months. Finally, uh, I have to mention that we have further discounts for registration and for sponsorship if you are a fourth member. And if you are not a fourth member, of course, this is a great time to become a fourth member and help us increase that number from 180 members to 280 members. Um, there's more information about membership on our website, of course, at fourthmobility.org. And there's more information about the Roadmap Conference at roadmapforth.org. One more thing before we get into today's content. Um, normally at our Roadmap Conference, we would also be presenting our second annual Roadmap Awards. And again, we're having to do this virtually, unfortunately, um, but I'm still pleased today to be presenting the Career Achievement Award. The Career Achievement Award is presented to an outstanding individual whose career has made a substantial lasting impact in promoting smart transportation. And this year, we are thrilled to present the fourth Career Achievement Award to Mary Nichols who's chair of the California Air Resources Board. As many of you may know, Chair Nichols has been a passionate champion for clean air throughout uh, decades of her career in government nonprofit sector. 
Some of her accomplishments and achievements include crafting California's internationally recognized climate action plan, serving as California Secretary of Natural Resources, Senior Staff Attorney at Natural Resources Defenses Council, and Assistant Administrator for US EPA's Office of Air and Radiation under President Clinton. Uh, unfortunately, Chair Nichols had something come up and was not able to join us uh, this morning, but I know she's with us in spirit. You can see on your screen this uh, beautiful uh, award that I, I trust is now uh, on her desk somewhere in California. With that, I do want to get to our panel. We couldn't do this work. We couldn't present this content without our sponsors. So I'd like to take a moment to recognize and thank our sponsor for today's webinar, ABB. And we have with us today, Dan O'Shea, Director of Utility Strategy and Business Development, EV Infrastructure at ABB. And Dan, could you say a few words for us, please? Sure thing. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff. And uh, I wanna uh, echo that we all wish we were uh, in Portland this week. Uh, it's not a stretch for me since I'm in Seattle, so I'm experiencing the same wonderful weather. Um, but I really miss the, the professional and personal camaraderie of, of Roadmap. And, and I've been at Roadmap since it was about 50 of us in a, in a couple of conference rooms. And ABB has been a proud sponsor for now going on six or seven years. And I consider myself extremely lucky now in my career, having done this now for about a decade, to be with ABB. Uh, my role here now is the Director of, of Utility Solutions and Business Development for the U.S. utility market. And uh, as a proud member of Forth, um, we are uh, very happy to be uh, collaborating with and in front of, of, of the members. And I wholeheartedly endorse Jeff's call for, for, for joining Forth uh, if you haven't already done so. What I wanna say is that in my travels uh, before COVID physically and then virtually around the country, I have a lot of reason for optimism despite uh, the COVID pandemic and, and the other challenges that we face, I see transportation electrification projects moving forward uh, virtually everywhere I go. And so this is, uh, this is quite promising, I think, for our industry uh, and a testament to the fact that this is important work that can really actually have a, a good impact on, on equity, uh, inclusion, and diversity as we move forward. We do need to do that correctly. And so I think that's important. Um, I have a, a few slides to share, although right now I can't really seem to move them forward. Um, there we go. Um, I'm excited to, to hear from our uh, panelists on cities leading the transportation electrification charge. And ABB holds a unique bird's eye view of, of smart cities and transportation electrification because we work in so many aspects of what we will call, what we do call beneficial electrification. And we as a company, have a goal of and are enablers of zero emission uh, communities and a zero emission economy with our electrification products and services. Uh, and so um, we, we really are committed not only to uh, vehicle electrification, but as you can see here, uh, all of the different aspects from the grid interconnection all the way down to the plug, including uh, energy storage and electricity products and services. So we really have a holistic view of, of how cities uh, can look at uh, transportation electrification as a part of their uh, entire uh, electrification portfolio. I want to share a couple of ABB uh, news items, um, if we could move that slide forward. Um, and, and I was looking forward to maybe a couple of uh, electric bus rides and a charging stop at our uh, Pantograph, uh, which we provide to TriMet in partnership with PGE. We are very excited about this project. PGE and TriMet are leading the, the United States in, in getting this done and showing that, that transit uh, is, uh, is uh, a huge part of what we're doing. Another uh, quick item on the next slide is that uh, we're, we've just announced with, that we're providing a uh, solar powered 175 kilowatt uh, charging station at a place called the Ray in Georgia. And for those of us who have been in sustainability for a while, this is named after Ray Anderson, the demigod of business sustainability. Um, and I had the pleasure of meeting Ray a few times and going to several of his uh, talks. And that is really, that was like going to church. And, and so ABB is very proud to, to have been 
to do this installation in Georgia. And then finally, something that really isn't about charging, but about electrification on a grand scale, where ABB's highly specialized maritime division is providing electric hybrid, hybrid power and DC energy storage for the Washington State Ferry Program. So this is something you'll see more news about going forward. And it shows uh, in a holistic way how ABB is, is committed to electrification. So with that, I'll throw it back to you, Jeff. Uh, happy uh, to be a part of Forth. Happy to sponsor and looking forward to this panel and next year as well. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dan, and I appreciate the shout out. And uh, if I might point out that whole ferry initiative in Washington started with a conversation between the governor's representative and someone we brought over as a keynote speaker at a roadmap several years back from Norway, who is talking about their work to electrify the ferry system. So. I love seeing these stories unfold over the course of several years that begin with a conversation over a beer at Roadmap. So I'm, I'm sorry that we can't be doing that today. Maybe some of you internationally, uh, it's late enough in the day that you can be having a beer while you're listening to this, but it's not quite the same. So with that, we will get into the uh, substance of today's session. And I'd like to turn it over to uh, our moderator, Kelly Blinn, who's the EV tech strategist at Natural Resources Defense Council, and as I'm sure she'll explain a bit, uh, has been uh, a close partner as we've been working with a number of cities through the Bloomberg American Climate Cities Challenge. And I'm really excited to hear what, what Kelly and our great panel today has to say. So take it away, Kelly. Great, thanks so much, Jeff. And good morning, everyone. We're really excited to kick off this webinar in City's role in accelerating transportation electrification. I uh, just wanted to say a, a quick word on sort of the context here. One of the ways that I think about this is, you know, cities sort of face a paradox in that their residents often have the lowest per capita. So most regional transportation emissions occur within their borders, given their role as, as economic hubs. So this leaves city policymakers with challenging choices about how to balance efforts to accelerate electric mobility with efforts to expand walking, cycling, and transit use, and how to ensure that the benefits of electrification are broadly shared and support those who have been historically most impacted by transportation pollution. I'm lucky to work with NRDC on the American Cities Climate Challenge, as Jeff mentioned. Um, and this is a program that supports 25 major American cities to implement their climate policies and programs that reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the buildings, energy, and transportation sectors. I work with these cities on their vehicle electrification policies and so get to see up close the ways in which cities are adopting both tried and true policies like city fleet electrification and EV ready codes, uh, as well as the ways in which cities are innovating and developing new strategies to accelerate uh, adoption of electric vehicles. For example, like supporting TNC drivers to electrify or pursuing low emission zones. So today we're gonna to get to hear about how three cities are working to accelerate electric mobility adoption in their own context. Uh, Washington DC and Denver, Colorado, which are two American cities, climate challenge cities. And Amsterdam, one of Europe's electric mobility leaders. So I'm going to go through introductions of our speakers first, and then we'll kick our, our presentations off. So first up, uh, we're going to have Mike Salisbury, the Transportation Energy Lead at the City and County of Denver. Uh, Mike started at the City and County of, of Denver as their Transportation Energy Lead in February of 2018. His focus is on promoting electric vehicles in all aspects of Denver's work, both within city operations and amongst the general public. Initiatives underway in Denver include expanding publicly available charging stations on city and private properties, electrifying rideshare vehicles and car share vehicles, and meeting the goal of 200 EVs in the city fleet by 2020, all of which I'm sure Mike will tell you more about. Mike began working in the Southwest Energy Efficiency Projects Transportation Program as a program associate in early 2009. And in 2008, Mike received a master's degree from the University of Delaware's Center for Energy and Environmental Policy. Uh, next up, we'll, we'll hear from Geert de Jong, Air Quality and Electric Mobility Program Manager with the City of Amsterdam. Geert is Program Manager um, of Air Quality and with his team 
works on realizing the goals stated in their Clean Air Action Plan to make the city a cleaner and healthier place for residents and visitors to the city. Uh, they focus their efforts on sources where uh, their measures will have the greatest impact, so road traffic, passenger vessels and pleasure craft, mobile machinery, and the burning of biogas and wood. Their aim is to be a zero emission city by 2030, which is quite ambitious. Uh, they support and promote sustainable mobility by introducing new environmental zones, promoting zero emission driving, and implementing measures that stimulate and facilitate the use of green mobility. And we'll hear you know, much more about some of the specifics there. Um, and finally, we'll have Eric Campbell, um, program analyst at the Department of Energy Environment in Washington, DC. Uh, Eric Campbell is a, a program analyst for the Renewable Energy and Clean Transportation branch at the Department of Energy and Environment uh, since 2016. He works on transportation regarding the Clean Energy DC plan with a specific focus on transportation electrification for fleets, private vehicles, and buses. The overall goal is to help the District of Columbia achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. Eric coordinates and guides other district agencies towards fleet electrification for both light and heavy duty vehicles. He's also developing the district's transportation electrification roadmap, which will guide the district to have 25% of registered vehicles be electric by 2030, 100% of buses and private fleets be zero emission by 2045. He holds a Master of Science in Environmental Science and a Master of Public Affairs from Indiana University. With that, I'd like to turn it over to our first speaker, uh, Mike Salisbury from the city and county of Denver. Please take it away. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Kelly. It's a pleasure to be here virtually. Uh, I do apologize. I have some video issues, so I'm just going to be uh, um, on audio today. And I even put on a nice collared shirt for everyone to see today, but oh well. Um, so let's see. Advance my slides, figure that out. Yeah, I work on all things electrification for the city and county of Denver. And just to start out, some of our goals that we've laid out of the city in our 80 by 50 climate action plan, which came out uh, two years ago. We have the goal of 30% of light duty vehicles being electric by 2030, and all the way up to 100% of light duty vehicles by 2050. So how I think about the city trying to go out and meet those goals, I tend to think of it in about three different buckets of work that I focus on and strategies, if you will. So how do we get more charging stations out there, private, public, all kinds of those? How do we increase access to electric vehicles? That's kind of electrified mobility. So it's not just about the stations, but also making sure there's more vehicles on the road, more people have access to vehicle electrification. Um, and then finally, really focusing on outreach, trying to get the um, word out to people about electric vehicles. And kind of underlying all of that is the city continuing and pushing forward on being a leader itself. So looking at our own fleet electrification, putting stations on private, um, on city properties to increase access to charging, and just trying to be you know, as out front as possible and advocating at the regional and state level for more aggressive uh, sustainability and electric vehicle policies. So in those different buckets, I think some of our you know, successes that I wanted to share on the charging station front, we're really excited. We've been working for a while now um, for a funding coming from the U.S. Department of Energy on a grant program to put more fast charging into the city of Denver. So this is focused on trying to support ride hail drivers, Uber and Lyft drivers who want to electrify, but they're all stations are also open to the public. So we've just opened up uh, four DC fast charging stations in uh, the city of Denver, which is really important because the way, you know, when I'm looking at the environment of fast charging, rightly so, a lot of that is focused on corridor charging, highway charging right now. And so it's very critical, I think, that we find ways to channel more of these fast charging stations into more urban areas, more urban core areas, to serve people like ride hail drivers and other people, again, who don't have perhaps access to charging at their homes. So that's a really exciting project. Uh, we have three more fast charging stations in the queue that we'll be putting in in 2020 to help build that project out. We hope to 
we'll learn a whole lot about that and how we can do a better job of supporting fast charging in urban areas. Along electrified mobility, we're really excited. We've been partnering with a local car share company, Ego Car Share, and also the Denver Housing Authority to do electrified car share at low and medium income properties in the city. So really trying to think of both, you know, providing both the charging and the mobility option in lower income communities. We've done one site, we're in the middle of doing our second site and we're always looking for more opportunities to ramp that up and figure out how we can expand that work. Outreach I think is, uh, as you all I think is probably challenging. We had some really big plans in 2020 about what our outreach plans looked like and I think that's obviously like a lot of cities, we've had to shift that focus um, due to COVID and looking at what kind of resources we can shift online, how we can engage resident, residents and businesses in appropriate ways around electrification when that's not maybe the first thing on their mind, and trying to figure out how we empower you know, our residents and our businesses to take on that outreach work themselves. So that's not just myself going out into the community and talking about electric vehicles, but kind of creating more EV champions who can get out there and spread the word on uh, electric vehicles and charging stations. Another, I think, really important success that I see is la last year we adopted a pretty aggressive electric vehicle ready building code for the city of Denver. We already had one for single family homes, but this um, is gonna require levels of charging um, for new multifamily and new commercial properties in the city. So uh, a, a level of, there'll be some charging stations at every new property. There'll be a certain percentage pre-wired for uh, future stations and then a chunk at multifamily and commercial that will just have the conduit. So we see this as being just a foundational policy that we need. You think about the you know, thousands of charging stations and all the growth that's gonna happen in Denver over the next 30 years to get to our 100% EV goal. And this seems like a really important foundational policy to address at least things on the, the new construction side. And I think just wanted to touch briefly on you know why we think that Denver is being successful. And I think a lot of it, you know, as a city, that picture, I don't know if it looks funky on everyone else on the screen, but it looks very funky on mine. It's supposed to show a climate rally from uh, last year. And, uh, but I think it's, you know, it's really that our, the residents of Denver are very passionate and very strong advocates for the city taking aggressive action on climate action. And that in turn gives and helps, and, and helps empower our elected officials um, mayor's office, city council members, to again be more aggressive and really push the city and push city staff to do more around vehicle electrification. Uh, and then I think what's really exciting is we just formed a new office of climate action, sustainability and resiliency in the effort to really focus the city's climate work and make it kind of its own independent office and really put a spotlight on our actions. And as part of that over the last six months or so, we've had a, a climate action task force. This has been consisted of a group of community, community stakeholders who are just about to release a set of recommendations for city actions on climate, and also will have recommendations on potential funding opportunities for the city to pursue. So that's been a really amazing process to really focus the city's effort and give us something to uh, focus on um, going forward. We have this great set of recommendations to move forward at the end of the day when this report gets released. And I am seeing something weird on the screen. I'm not sure if everyone else has seen that, but anyway, uh, my, my last slide is, oh, there we go, sorry. Um, and I really think, you know, what also makes us very successful and is so critical for the city is, you know, partnerships that we build to get all this stuff done. None of the projects that I've talked about, we didn't do them by ourselves. Um, this, this is a, a brief um, list of some of the organizations we work with and have partnered with to make things happen in Denver and Colorado. And there's many, many more that we could name, but I think it's just really critical that we recognize that Everything we do is with, you know, with the private sector, with other public sector agencies, businesses, both in the charging station side and the vehicle side, nonprofits, advocacy organizations. Like, 
it's all, I mean, I think there's a great ecosystem here and we all learn from each other, but we all build together towards the same goals. And I think there's, you know, sitting in a, you know, silo in the city, I think the ability to accomplish things would be so much more limited. So I think that for myself is something I'm very grateful for in the environment we work in, but also just is so foundational to the success and hopefully the future successes that we have um, in the city of Denver. I believe, yeah, that is my last slide. So thank you very much. Great, thanks so much, Mike, for that overview. And um, I know folks are starting to find the attendee chat. Um, please feel free to submit your questions and we'll have time for Q&A at the end. And so next up, we have Geert de Jong from the city of Amsterdam, if you'd like to take it away. Thank you, Kelly, and good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, I like to talk with you about the uh, Amsterdam EV ambition and our air quality ambition. Um, yes, I have to get my slides ready. <laughs> Here it is, <laughs> my slides. Um, uh, so, um, first of all, our ambi ambition, uh, like Kelly uh, already mentioned in the introduction, Amsterdam wants to be zero emission in 10 years, in 2030. So this is a very big uh, ambition and we have to get a lot of things done to, 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 to achieve that. Um, the main goal, the main reason to, to, to have this ambition is that we want to comply the WHO um, air quality values. Um, so we, we had in Amsterdam a big issue with European uh, air quality values. Uh, we almost have them, have them uh, complied and we're now striving to comply the WHO uh, air quality values. So air quality is our main reason to, to focus on zero emission. And besides, uh, another big reason is, of course, CO3, CO2 reduction. So with our measurements, we reduce CO2, CO2 in Amsterdam with about 10%. Um, so um, uh, how do we get this done? So how do we reach this goal? Um, um, well, Sorry, a little technical problem here. Um, um, so our first the first big step is that we want to um, have zero emission uh, ring roads within Amsterdam in five years for almost all traffic except um, passenger cars. Uh, so uh, uh, taxis, uh, buses, uh, vans, um, uh, boats, uh, public transport, everything has to be emission free in uh, uh, five years within the big ring road of Amsterdam. So it's the A10 for, for those of you who know uh, the city. Uh, so it's a big area uh, and we have to, 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 um, uh, to, to take a lot of me measurements in the next five years, four years to, to get that done. And after that, the main goal is to, to get the, to the, to the emission-free zone in the wall of Amsterdam. Uh, so everybody has to be zero emission, also passenger cars. And uh, that's a big challenge on several fronts. So we, have, we need a lot of more loading infrastructure. We have to stimulate the transition in the, in the, in the next few years. Um, uh, we also need the government of the Netherlands to, to, to get us the, the, the right regulations to, to get this done. Um, and our strategy is mainly um, um, has mainly four um, uh, points, and it's a combination of stimulating electric elect electric traffic, uh, facilitate it by charging infrastructure, regulate it uh, as much as we can, and, and communicate about it. So to 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 inform everybody about the the challenge and the possibilities also to to use uh, car uh, zero emission uh, traffic. Um, well, this is another picture you, it's, it's more or less the same, the same. Uh, so this is the big ring road within Amsterdam, the, the orange, uh, the orange part. 
uh, and uh, the world to city emission free in 2030. Uh, so it's a big green area. Um, so important thing is uh, that we believe it's not only a technological challenge to get a uh, to get enough uh, emission uh, free cars and uh, the right to total cost of ownership and enough loading infrastructure. Um, uh, but it's also a matter of cooperation with all those stakeholders who have, have to, to make this transition. So all the companies in Amsterdam, all the citizens of Amsterdam, the public transport companies, the boating companies, all those stakeholders have to, to, to make a big step in the next few years. So I think it's an important point, an important challenge. It's, that's not about technological innovation and transition, but also to, 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 to move the city and to, to, get, to, to get its movement uh, uh, ready. Um, uh, and besides that, we are now um, experimenting with a lot of pylons and smart solutions and of course, charging infra infrastructure. Um, and that's my next slide. So right now we have about uh, 1800 charging points in the city. Since I think about 10 years, we are expanding this uh, network and it has a total of almost 4,000 charging points. So we can load 4,000 cars uh, at the same time in Amsterdam. It's a lot, but for our mission, it isn't enough. Uh, um, um, so we still have a big challenge to scale this infrastructure, uh, to upscale this infrastructure. And till 2025, we need between 16,000 and 23,000 public charging points, depending on uh, the exact uh, development, techno technological development. So that's a big challenge and a lot of work which, which have to be done. Uh, uh, not only to, to get those charging points, but also to integrate them in the public space and in the underground and the network of the city. Um, and uh, it's not about only about numbers, but also about innovation. So we are really uh, um, um, working now with, for example, flex power and vehicle to grid pilot projects to, to get more capacity and a uh, more efficient network. Um, so that's, uh, that's yeah, in short, in a few minutes, my story. If, if anybody has questions, you can, you can, uh, uh, put them in the chat room and we can talk later about it. So thank you very much, everybody. Great. Thank you so much, Geert. Really appreciate the presentation. And um, as you mentioned, yeah, please please feel free to put your, your questions into the chat. Um, we are going to interrupt our program briefly um, before getting to Eric Campbell from DC uh, to go back to our Roadmap Career Achievement Award, um, since we now have our, our winner on the phone with us um, to, to say a few words. Um, so yeah, just, just want to pass the, the mic and video over to uh, this year's winner, Mary Nichols, uh, Chair of the California Air Resources Board, uh, and give her a, a few minutes to accept the award and, and, and say a few things. So thanks so much for being here with us today. Well, thank you for inviting me, and I apologize for showing up at an inconvenient time. I won't bore you with the details of how I managed to not get in earlier when I meant to, but um, I had an opportunity because of that to listen to uh, the earlier presentations, which actually only go to um, underscore the point that I wanted to make this morning, which is how important the work that Forth and your attendees at this conference are doing in spreading the word in real uh, concrete, so to speak, bad pun, uh, detail about what it takes to actually electrify cities. You know, uh, the 
breadth and the extent of what's going on uh, at the urban level around the world uh, is remarkable. It's been building for years now. Uh, I am proud that California has played a role in it, mainly through our uh, work on uh, vehicles and promoting the uh, production of more and different varieties of electric vehicles, but also helping to uh, create a vision which, uh, although it differs from place to place, is fundamentally the same, which is of cities that are clean and are uh, uh, vibrant and also serve the needs of their people in ways that at the moment we're only beginning to conceive of. Uh, I know all of us, uh, wherever we're from, have been dealing with the effects of um, various types of quarantines and shutdown orders coming as a result of the global pandemic. And it really has served to uh, illustrate, I think, if we and I'm sure most of you on this call don't need this uh, uh, education, but for others at least, it shows how incredibly interconnected we all are, how uh, technology can either help us or hurt us, and how uh, the limits of our imagination in terms of how to live better uh, have not yet been reached. So. Uh, I've been an admirer of this organization, Forth, uh, ever since I first heard of it. Uh, I've been uh, envious of your uh, ability to move quickly and to uh, incorporate so many new uh, people and so many new projects. Uh, not that we are anywhere close to saturation in terms of uh, our, our reach with um, electric vehicles, but we're beginning to see some opportunities that I think uh, only a year or two ago even would have been considered to be impossible, now looking as though they are not only possible, but necessary uh, for the survival of our cities and for their ability to continue doing what cities do best, which is to bring people together, but in new and different ways. So. Um, I feel uh, honored uh, to be recognized by you all. Um, I am really proud uh, that you uh, have uh, chosen me for this particular award. And uh, I just wanna give you my commitment that as long as I'm still around on this planet, I intend to be working with you on uh, furthering the cause. Uh, so thank you very much. Great, thank you so much for being on with us today and for all the work that you do. Uh, we really appreciate it. And with that, we'll, we can resume our program. We have one more speaker um, and then we'll get into more of a, a Q&A discussion um, and we're seeing lots of great questions come in. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it over to Eric Campbell from Washington, DC. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's not every day I get to follow a literal superhero uh, who is championing the worth in the uh, EV space, So, and to also follow along with two other cities who have been doing such great work. Um, so hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Campbell. I'm a program analyst at the Department of Energy and Environment. And I want to talk about a little bit with regards to what DC is doing currently. Uh, and the way that we see our, ro our role as uh, adapting over the years. Um, what I hope to do is give a brief overview of where we are right now, how we got here, and where we're looking to go towards. Um, with that, we'll get started. I uh, hope everyone's enjoying their breakfast, lunch, or in some case, an early bird dinner while we chat about the great things doing in the EV space. So first, I want to give a rough district uh, at a glance, uh, sort of where we are within the electrification field. Um, First off, with uh, public buses, um, the circulator system in DC is our own uh, bus system run by our District Department of Transportation. Um, we currently have two, at least at, at least of this writing, one of the largest EV uh, bus fleets or electric bus fleets on the East Coast. Um, we have currently 14 Proterra buses, um, which uh, serve as our circulator uh, system, with more coming along the way. We've also have gone through the um, uh, trials and tribulations of installing the infrastructure for these buses and 
Uh, also have gained so much learning experience from uh, with regards to uh, sort of any early adopter prop, uh, um, issues that have come up to it with it. Um, additionally, uh, along with GDOT, our local uh, transit authority, WMATA, uh, has also been a recipient of the low no grants. Um, we, the uh, DDOT has received around $2 million in low no grants where WMATA has received around $4 million recently. Uh, this was announced, I think, about a week ago. Uh, for those of you who do not know about the low no grants, they are a Department of Energy um, grants that are done annually, and it is a great resource for cities that are looking for additional federal funding with regards to um, reducing their uh, nitrous oxide or diesel um, powered bus, uh, bus system. Additionally, uh, we have our electric uh, taxi cabs. Currently, we, our fleet uh, is sitting around 150 electric taxi cabs. Um, this was one of our first early adopting uh, methods for uh, electrifying light duty fleets within the district. And um, we have uh, also gone through the trials and tribulations of dealing with first generation EVs and how they are uh, seen within the electric taxi cab space. Um, as you can see on the right, we also have a uh, the fun folder to look for of a Proterra um, bus um, model shoot, uh, which is one of my favorite folders. And below we have one of our centralized charging hubs for uh, EV taxi specifically at our Union Station location with um, three D DC fast charger uh, station, um, which provides a central location for taxi cabs to charge. Um, with regards to how we are doing with our EV registrations within the district, we have around uh, 1,500 uh, plug-in uh, hybrid electric vehicles, uh, or a combination of plug-in hybrid and battery electric vehicles within the district. Um, and if we were to look at the entire DMV, which would include uh, both the district, Maryland, and Virginia, roughly within an 80-mile radius, they're roughly around, we're estimating around 13,000 of these vehicles. With regards to how we are providing the infrastructure for these, um, within the district alone, we have around 144 charging stations. Uh, this is a mix of both level twos and DC fast chargers, but, uh, but the majority of them are actually level twos, which are located within parking garages, at businesses, hotels, um, and at some retail businesses. The DC fast chargers, besides the one that I mentioned with the uh, centralized um, location within the uh, Station. We have a few that are located uh, in parking lots and at taxi cab locations as well. So this is where we are currently within our uh, district um, electrification effort. So a lot of so I want to talk on how we got to this point. Um, a lot of this was started off with the release of the Clean Energy DC plan back in uh, 2017 and 2018. And what it was is it's our district plan on how we want to achieve a sustainable DC. Um, and building upon some of the work that's been done. Uh, the overall goal is to become carbon neutral by 2050. Um, uh, thank you for Amsterdam for uh, clipping us at an even quicker rate, uh, but it's also to challenge ourselves to make sure that we are making um, strong changes towards um, becoming, car uh, becoming carbon neutral. The Clean Energy DC plan uh, handles areas such as um, energy generation, where we're getting our electricity from, buses, and transportation. With regards to transportation, uh, we have laid out 11 different action items that um, uh, are you know, summar uh, sum roughly summarized here. And in some cases, our main goal with Clean Energy DC is when we did the modeling to say, how do we achieve carbon neutrality? A lot of it came, which I'm assuming is similar to other cities, that we need to really focus on boat shifting actions and to help support our own individual plan called Move DC, which should be uh, updated within the next two years. Again, um, to say on how do we get people out of single occupancy vehicles into more uh, transit, bike, and walking options. But within the transportation sector, we also laid out 11 different action items for electric vehicles. Um, this is in the forms of electric vehicle readiness, making sure that we have the necessary charging infrastructure available, electric vehicle adoption, which is to make sure that the proper way of education uh, and offering, the trying to find the right targeted uh, assistance for uh, procuring electric vehicles, um, as well as to, to what we realized through our modeling that we saw that we achieved over a 65% uh, um, VMT uh, emission reduction by the amount of trips that were transported over from a single occupancy vehicle over to an electric bus, where we thought that's where we saw the majority of our greenhouse gas emissions reduction. 
And so uh, some of our action items are focused on shifting to zero emission transit vehicles as well. And finally, looking uh, ahead as what everyone says will happen the next five years for the past 20 years is sort of anticipating the need for electric autonomous vehicles as well. So for uh, Fortune 500, then we have uh, very uh, degrees of um, uh, both from anything from curbside management to uh, road, road diets at the same time. A lot of this is being explored. Now, the Clean Energy DC plan gives us a general um, uh, approach to, okay, so we have done some rough modeling, but how do we actually get here? And this actually brings us to our next, the next piece of legislation called the Clean Energy DC Omnibus Act of 2018. Uh, back on back in 2019, which even though it, seemed, it was just a year ago, seems a decade ago, but the timeline we're living in, uh, our mayor signed the CEDC Omnibus Act into law. Um, the Clean Air Omnibus Act gives us more legal representation on, sorry, um, behooves our agencies in order to adopt some of the standards that were presented in Clean Energy DC, and it covers everything from renewable energy, energy efficiency, buildings, uh, and transportation. Specifically, uh, and this is all uh, files that we can share later if people are interested in more of the uh, details to see on how our cities are doing. But specifically, in Title V, it looked at transportation emission reduction, which behooves both our DDOT as well as the mayor's office to propose two, uh, two different um, options. One is to produce a transportation electrification program, and the second, a clean vehicle transition plan. Um, what we have decided to do in, in this case was to be combine these two into uh, what we want as a transportation electrification roadmap. And that's where, um, within the goals of this roadmap, we have three different goals that we want to achieve. Uh, the first one is for um, buses and private fleets to be 50% low emission or zero emission vehicles um, by 2030, which will then scale up to 100% zero emission vehicles by 2045. The second goal that we want to achieve is 100% of EV replacements of public buses and school buses by the end of their useful life by 2021. So by 2021, we hope to provide uh, options for our school buses and our public buses and provide a method, of, uh, a method and mean for them to become electric by, uh, 20, uh, by 2021. And the third goal described in the bio that by 2030, we want at least 25% of uh, zero emission vehicles, the battery electric vehicles regi uh, registered in the district uh, by 2030. This would, if we were to take our current uh, stock lease, this would mean that we would want to achieve around 75,000 EV to be registered in the district. Now, uh, additionally, with this, we also want to uh, make sure that the roadmap provides uh, policies, cost estimates, as well as timelines in order to achieve, uh, achieve these goals. So where are we in the status of this so far? Well, um, when we were researching this, um, we actually took a lot of inspiration from what we learned at Roadmap and took a lot of inspiration from what we learned from other cities. Um, we used some of the, uh, uh, looked at some of the plans that have been released by Pittsburgh, San Francisco, Fort Collins, uh, the proposal made in Boston, Austin, New York, um, the Smart City Columbus options, and uh, Seattle. I could, list, if I list every city that we looked through, it would be nothing but a list of cities that are doing these great works in these fields. Um, and I also want to give a special shout out to Roadmap as well, uh, but actually one year ago, as Facebook reminded me that I was so excited to be exploring Portland and eating donuts and burgers and having delicious beer while learning about some of the amazing work that uh, other cities are doing, which actually helped a lot in trying to find out the, um, uh, the scale and the scope of how we wanted to develop this roadmap. Um, we also, so since I know some of your cities also have, um, are within the state, uh, we also were able to procure additional funding for the, uh, this outside of the legislation um, from the Department of Energy State Energy Program. So putting, pulling together these resources, we realized that a grant would be the best process, and we decided to release an RFA. This was released in December of, of uh, December 20 of 2019. It closed in January of 2020, and we were looking to have the competitive process um, completed by the end of March. And if any of you know what probably happens in our timelines, things haywired a little bit and we've been facing a lot of delay of delays in that field however that doesn't actually stop us from the continued development of roadmap we are very close to uh kind of hoping that we would be able to announce a winner of roadmap but unfortunately not not everything has been completed yet um but there's a lot of different projects that we're working on in the meantime um the for example uh some of our ddot uh colleagues have been working on a curbside 
uh, charging rulemaking, which then designates on within a policy framework how charging stations can be installed on our curbside. We also worked with our partners at Force to de develop a mobile EV showcase in order to uh, continue to do outreach to uh, com uh, communities and say, hey, if you're thinking about uh, switching over to an EV, here's how you can do so. Uh, here's how you can do so. Um, we also have been slowly starting to build our stakeholder engagement group and trying to bring the people together about who would be interested in providing feedback, uh, peer review for the roadmap to make sure that as we do finally uh, release it, we make sure that it's accepted by the overall public. And additionally, thanks to our partner that uh, through AFCCC, we have also uh, developed an EV training for public fleet managers as well. Another part that I wanted to um, bring up that we've been that we've completed this time, we've worked with Forth, uh, who is one of our AFCCC um, partners, to release an equity and practice um, uh, guiding for any cities that are looking to complete the roadmap to make sure that equity is built into the development of a roadmap instead of adding on to, as an additional component of it. Um, the report provides recommendations and examples of equity practices from various different cities, such as uh, Berkeley, Seattle, uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and, ma and many more. Um, I believe this would actually be uh, open for folks to be able to view as well. Uh, it was designed specifically for us, but it does provide some great takeaways um, for if you want to be incorporating uh, equity into any roadmap development that you're going through. Um, so that's, you know, keeping it question because I've been seeing so many um, great questions pop up. I did want to try to keep that as close to 10 minutes as possible and giving it an overall out, uh, overview of, of where we are in the district. So I know we probably have tons of questions coming in. And I think um, we are eager to get to them as quickly as possible. Great. Thank you so much, Eric, and to all of our speakers. And thanks for everybody writing in with some great questions. Um, I'm actually going to tee up sort of a, a bit of a, a question that I had written down beforehand, just based on the experience that we've had working with cities across um, the climate challenge that I mentioned, which is sort of the difficulty of, of changing the bureaucracy of a city to work on electric mobility. And I wanted to ask the presenters, if, if you could say a little bit more about where you sit within your city's organization, how you've worked to drive change um, internally at your city, and what lessons you've learned in the process. Maybe we can uh, start off with Eric and, and then go back through. Great. Um, so uh, I joined um, the Department of Energy and Environment as originally as a state energy program manager, but um, I initially came from the Electrification Coalition um, and SAFE located in Washington, D.C. I worked on the uh, um, uh, Smart City, um, the, sorry, uh, U.S. Smart City Challenge. Um, um, that, was, that was completely back in 2015, 2016. And uh, when I was hired for at DOEE, I was originally for a state energy program position. Um, and electric vehicle, they were the small project within electric vehicles at the um, Interstate Energy Program, and I sort of built it out from them. Um, what happened next uh, going on was uh, then, you know, connecting with the other uh, district agencies, and the first really big piece that we did to help foster a change was to put together um, an interagency working group um, just to coordinate more effort between what our, um, our folks at uh, Department of Public Work were doing, what our folks at General Services, um, who sorry, public work for vehicles, general services for a building, and how all of them sort of work together, as well as our team over at DDOT, the Department of Hired Vehicles, um, and really just communicating. We didn't want to run into the Starbucks problem where everyone was trying to do their own program and they realized they were just across the street from each other. Um, and that was actually one of the big things that helped foster the change um, to look at electric vehicle um, and to look at how we wanted this to be incorporated. Um, it was about roughly a year, year and a half ago that um, my role officially changed into handling specifically um, uh, electric vehicles. But um, I'm housed within the Department of Energy and Environment, and we provide a lot of like, best practices and guidances towards the other um, city, uh, sorry, the other uh, district agencies as well. I think in a long about round, I answered the question there. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's great. Geert or Mike, um, anything you'd like to add about your experience engaging with internal stakeholders at your cities? 
Well, I can say something about uh, that, uh, Kelly. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, very important to do it together with all our colleagues within the city because uh, zero emission mobility, it's about mobility uh, and about reachability of the city. So we can do this with our stakeholders within the city. So our program started about 10 years ago at the Department of Transportation and Mobility, and now it's housed in a Department of uh, Sustainability. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, not a big issue. We have, we have to work together. It's, it's as simply as that. And it started in Amsterdam very small. It started about yeah, pioneering in this area. It, it, it grows, it has, has been grown bigger and bigger in the last 10 years. And uh, now we have a team about for about 30, uh, uh, 40 members and we are still growing. So, um, so maybe one day we, are, we have our own department. <laughs> <laughs> That would be nice. <laughs> I think that'd be great. So, so some of the other questions that we were getting related to more of our sort of the external stakeholders that you all have to, to work with and collaborate with, um, sort of that importance of, I think, the ecosystem of stakeholders, as, as Mike mentioned. Um, a few folks asked how you all have collaborated with your electric utilities um, and how you view their role with respect to your efforts um, in, in city transportation electrification? Well, uh, it's very, very important. So the, the, the electricity demand is growing and growing, not only from electric mobility, but also from uh, the, the uh, um, a housing transition, big data centers, so that's a big issue. And in the past, we were only looking at, uh, for the short term, so what's necessary in the next two till four years. And now we are working close together with the Electricity Corporation, or how do you say that in English, um, to, to uh, strategically program the demand for the next 40 years. So to, to get Amsterdam ready for, for the big sustainability transition, not only on mobility, but on all areas. So it's, 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 uh, it's very important. Um, obviously, uh, when electric vehicles, it requires a, elect electricity um, and working with the utilities to make sure that we are um, having the necessary infrastructure put in play, what do we need, how do we um, engage with them? It's pretty paramount for anything from installing uh, charging stations to provide, uh, providing incentives. Um, well, it can, recently, we went through a, um, a public service commission uh, filing with our local utility, PEPCO, um, I think filing 1155, yeah, 1155, and uh, where they put out their own program to uh, increase the amount of infrastructure throughout the city. And there was a lot of back and forth. And um, they originally came out with 13 different offerings from uh, stalling charging stations to um, smart meter gathering, uh, smart data gathering. Um, and it did require a lot of, you know, a lot of feedback, a lot of a deep, uh, deep um, soft conversation with um, our electric vehicle associations of DC, um, some of the building stakeholders as well, um, and the charging companies as well to make sure that uh, the right type of uh, input was uh, regarded as well as um, um, stakeholder representatives um, were present at a lot of those meetings. Um, we were part of a working group that helped after the initial plan was released to help find down and find some of the greater answers that we needed to do, such as what were the uh, you know, appropriate incentives to um, uh, to championing different resolves to make sure that um, a lot of the ratepayers are protected as well. Um, in, in DC, it's a very uh, interesting situation since uh, we are a city bordered by two states, uh, a state of our own, one day maybe. Um, so we, uh, a lot of times, we are in a difficult position because our stakeholder engagement has to be for our own uh, district residents as well as all the commuters that come in as well, which I assume almost every city has to deal with in some form or another.
Great. Thanks. Thanks for those inputs. Um, some of our other questions that we've been getting in are sort of thinking beyond electric passenger vehicles um, to other forms of electric mobility. We had one question from Sam Starr about are all of you including e-bikes and e-cargo bikes into your, your mobility planning, whether for personal shared or commercial use or e-commerce delivery? We had sort of a similar question about using electric trucks for, for food bank, food distribution. So just curious if you could speak to sort of beyond the passenger vehicle, uh, what you're thinking about for electric mobility. Sure, this is Mike. I think that we absolutely do that. I think, you know, like lots of cities, we, we don't actually we don't want people to drive. You know, we actually want them to take other things besides their single occupancy vehicle to do errands and drive into their job. So we work really closely with our Department of Transportation and Infrastructure, um, planning departments, and are really trying to think creatively about how we kind of you know if we're doing electrification charging station, can we make that some kind of you know people talk about about mobility hubs, so you're having lots of different transportation infrastructure in one site whether that be a way for e-bikes to charge or an e-bike sharing program or a car share or ride sharing. So really trying to think holistically uh, as you're planning forward with our infrastructure about how we can make infrastructure that in places that work for a wide variety of modes. We very much want to make sure that we're not just focused on people charging their own individually owned vehicles because that doesn't get us all the way to our climate or mobility goals. Um, oh, to follow up on that, uh, we also, when riding within our own transportation electrification program, one of the, um, sorry, in the RFA, one of the goals that we wanted to make sure we were writing in is to say that we, you know, want this plan, this roadmap to obviously help fuel switch uh, individuals out of um, you know, the fuel switch their vehicles to electric, but also to prioritize uh, mode shifting as well, which is you know, one of the main uh, pillars of our clean energy DC plan. That's where we realize that we get the most savings from. We don't have any uh, programs yet for um, electric uh, cargo bikes. Um, that has definitely been discussed a few times and working to see how we can incorporate that into our overall planning um, as a dedicated uh, Bike person here, um, uh, we <laughs> I, I we have done so much work. Um, if anyone's interested in how we've been looking at mode shift, uh, our Go DC Go program has been working specifically for um, how to get people back onto bikes and different types of commuting options within the district. Um, I will personally say the first time I um, rode an electric bike, I was skeptical. Uh, but I have never felt closer like a nine-year-old um, ever again after I started riding one of those uh, around. Um, so we are uh, we are looking at it. Uh, we currently don't have any uh, program right now. Great. Thanks so much for that. Um, I'm going to take us on a bit of a technical tack because we got a lot of questions about uh, vehicle to grid when you talked a little bit about that, Geert, and so wanted to tee up a few of those questions and if um, Eric or Mike, if you guys are also thinking in that direction, would love to hear you as well. Um, so some of the questions we got were, could you talk more about how this technology is envisioned to be incorporated into the city's plans um, and whether you're projecting sort of a positive business case for V2G with um, either personal or heavy duty uh, vehicles? So yeah, of course. First of all, I'm I'm not a big technical expert, um, uh, uh, and I only have a bit of a boring answer. Um, uh, it's it it is important, but we are still piloting with it, so we are not sure yet if there is a positive business case and and how do we, and how we can incorporate it in our network. But uh, it's sure that we need this kind of solutions to to get uh, our mission done. So it's not only possible with just placing new charging points. So we also have to look to, to innovative solutions like vehicle to grid or flex power. Great, thanks. Eric or Mike, anything that you all have been working on related to vehicle to grid, either passenger vehicles or buses or anything? 
Uh, we haven't looked at anything for passenger vehicles, but more for um, uh, school buses um, as well as transit buses. Most of the transit buses are running pretty consistently to take advantage of any vehicle to grid. Um, however, we haven't, you know, we are very, very much on the conceptual stage on this point, but we have been looking to see uh, where some of these um, technology meant for school buses to provide any point source power um, or our, uh, maybe not for a grid, but for uh, V2B uh, vehicle to building, um, as well as uh, providing like emergency generation. We have, you know, um, thought about this process as an additional benefit for electrifying our school bus fleet. Um, but we don't have any of the hardcore, um, uh, we haven't done, not done any hardcore technical analysis like that right now. We are, have been looking at it as an option. So. Okay, great. Thanks so much. And I'm just getting word that we have time for, for one more question. Um, I guess this question is a little bit of like a rubber meets the road type question. Um, Terry Spring had this for, for Washington, D.C., but I think we can open it up to our other panel panelists um, about how your plan is funded or what funding mechanisms are available for achieving your city's um, electrification goals, um, if you all can, can speak to that um, as we wrap up. Uh, so, uh, sorry. sorry. Great. My apology. <laughs> so in Amsterdam, it's funded via parking policy. So parking uh, um, um, permits, uh, people have to pay for parking permits, and that's the way uh, air quality and a lot of other projects in Amsterdam are funded. Um, as I mentioned uh, in my presentation, the one of the goals of a roadmap is to lay out the um, cost, uh, cost and policies that we need in order to achieve our electrification um, transportation electrification goals um, uh, we um, you know the funding for our current electrification roadmap um, comes from what we call the renewable energy development fund uh, as well as through our state energy program um, I do know a lot of other states have been using danger programs or SEP funding um, for uh, their um, transportation electrification program um, as well, and we have been actively pursuing uh, federal grants um, for these types of programs, specifically for buses, um, such as the low no grant that I referred to earlier. Um, the uh, EERE and DOE provide a lot of different federal uh, grant opportunities. I have known um, NRDC talked about this, I think, at one of our webinars. Um, Forth has definitely um, brought it up. Uh, as, and uh, as well as other our additional uh, ACCC partners, um, uh, as, as they have looked for additional funding opportunities. Um, but one thing, we're in the nascent stage, so we are still looking for saying, okay, are we, uh, what are going to be our um, cost mechanism for achieving these goals, which we're really hoping that our roadmap will help um, guide us to. I'll just add Thanks. for Denver. Yeah, ahead, uh, just, if we have time, just very quickly, I think, yeah, we are, I mentioned we're going to this climate action task force process, essentially trying to identify can we find a dedicated source of funding for our climate work in the city of Denver. Right now it's kind of a you know, part of just general funding in the city, and it's really, I think, a priority for the residents um, and also, I think, elected officials to try to find a way to make that uh, you know, dedicated source of funding. We're examining a bunch of different ways we might make that possible. Obviously, we're in a, a, a weird space. We started all this before COVID, and now with COVID, going to say the ballot to ask for a tax increase is a little more hairy than it might have been a few months ago. So, trying to you know be strategic and think about how we can fund our work going forward and expand the work um, in the next you know years and decades. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for participating, for sharing your experiences and plans, and for everyone who's attended to um, write in your, your questions and comments. Um, let's see, we just have a few sort of announcements to, to wrap things up. The next webinar in the fourth roadmap series will be charging heavy duty electric vehicles uh, tomorrow on June 18th. Um, the moderator, 
uh, will be Patti Monahan from the California Energy Commission um, and panelists include Nathan Hill from, from Daimler Trucks North America, uh, Sean Yench from Penske Truck Leasing, and Simon Horton um, from Southern California Edison. So it should be a really great panel. I know we had some questions that we weren't able to get to um, about heavy duty electric vehicles. So hopefully you'll be able to tune in and get some of your questions answered then. Um, and just a, a final quick announcement is, um, I know that there were some uh, questions about getting some of the materials referenced today. There will be a roadmap webinar recap that will get sent out on Friday. Um, so keep your eye out in the email for that. Um, and finally, a reminder that I think I was supposed to say earlier is uh, if you're posting things on social media that you learned today or commentary, uh, please use the hashtag roadmap fourth. Um, and you can also follow along um, on Twitter or on LinkedIn at, at Fourth Mobility. So thanks so much, everyone. Uh, Symbiot or anyone else at Fourth, if I'm missing anything else, please jump in. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for, for your time and hope you all have a great rest of your day.